In Matthew chapter 6, of course, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount of Beatitudes, uh, really toward the middle end of his, of his sermon, exhorts the people not to worry. And worry is, it's an American hobby. Worry, worry. Now, what brings on worry? Lack of faith, lack of certainty. Now, who tends to worry more? Those who have plenty or those who have little? Those who have plenty tend to worry more than those have, than have the little. And right here, Jesus exhorts the people, Do, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or wear. Now, that cuts to the heart because it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, tall, short. Nobody's allowed to worry. But then he says something interesting. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, the food, the water, the clothes, maybe a little extra on the side, it will be given to you as well. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? And yet, I think very interestingly, I think Jesus said this not just as a good idea, but I believe that this was a statement that must have been stuck in the ears of his disciples, all the more of his apostles. Because when you were with Jesus, the only thing you thought about was the now. Let's turn to Mark chapter 6, our theme text. Jesus' call to the people was not to prioritize their life and the needs that come with life, food, water, the necessities of life. He said, rather, I want you to concern yourselves, consume yourselves with God's glory, with making sure that, that, that your heart is consumed with seeking first which is a sense of absolute priority, God's kingdom, which is a composition of His people, and His righteousness. You can't do one without the other. You can't possibly see God's kingdom and yet not be righteous. <clears throat> and you can't possibly be righteous to the extent that God calls us if you're not about building up His kingdom. Why? Because the will of God is what? For you to be righteous? That's not what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 2 says, the will of God is for every man and woman to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You cannot seek first His righteousness if you are not about seeking first His kingdom. They go hand in hand. But it is tempting to want to do the other, right? One or the other. Look, well, I feel like I'm doing it with my relationship with God. I don't need the church. You must not read your Bible much. 1 Corinthians 12 says that every, part of the every member is a part of the body. Now, if I were to cut my finger off, I'd be a little freaked out. Why? Not because it hurts, but because if my finger dies, I'm not going to be able to have it put back on. In the same way, each individual part of the body cannot survive without the body as a whole. So one individual cannot survive without the discipleship, accountability, and worship that the church and kingdom brings to us. Amen? And yet... Don't worry about tomorrow. T tomorrow's going to worry about itself. You know why he said that? Because Jesus knew that he was going to put his apostles through hell on earth so they could get everyone wow. to heaven. Yeah. Don't worry about tomorrow. Yeah. Man, when, when, when I'm struggling to get my 20 times in, I'm not thinking about when I'm going to save up for a car or anything else because, man, I just got to get my 20 times together. I'm not going to think about baptizing someone at Cal Poly Pomona when I'm trying to baptize someone here and now. But so often we're consumed with the future and we just let the day go by. And what happens is that today becomes tomorrow and it's just this cycle of the same thing over and over again. You're so focused on the future, which is really a false ideal of what you want. It's really just a form of self-righteousness to make yourself feel better. I'll be righteous tomorrow. I'll get my life on straight tomorrow. But the reality is you're not going to do it tomorrow because if you were going to do it tomorrow, you'd already be doing it today. 
This was diets, right? Like, hey, starting Monday. <laughs> yeah, but it's Friday. And that's why we go on a buffet all week long, baby. <laughs> but Monday, but Monday never ends up coming, does it? Or it does come for a little while, but then you gain weight again, and then Monday comes back again, right? right? But what's really, the, what's lacking, really? It's just the overall lack of character to have the self-discipline to be healthy. It's the same in our relationship with God. I'll be a better disciple tomorrow. Don't be a better disciple tomorrow. Be a better disciple now. Don't get your life on straight tomorrow. Do it now. And so the title of today's lesson is a day in the ministry of Jesus. A day in the ministry of Jesus. And I'll say it one more time for both McQueen and Stevie. A day in the ministry of Jesus. Because let me tell you something. When you're a disciple in Jesus' ministry... During Jesus' time, you did not worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow, you knew tomorrow was going to worry about itself because Jesus was going to do something crazy. When Jesus is driving out the sheep and the people out of the temple, who knows what he's going to do tomorrow? Let's just focus on today. And Matt, Mark chapter 6 is one day. And I think it's going to be pretty powerful to see, wow, if we're going to be disciples of the 21st century, we must emulate the same conviction, heart, of the first century. Amen? Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Point number one is, where there is a will, you will find the way. Where there is a will, you will find the way. And of course, we understand that the way is Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Where there is a will, you will find the way. Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Jesus left there, and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Well, that seems good, right? Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that he has been given? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Not a good amazement. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. There's two times that Jesus was amazed. The first time is the centurion. He was amazed at his great faith. But this is not a good amazement here. It says Jesus was amazed at awe. Words cannot describe. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Wow. Is Jesus amazed with us this morning? And if so, why? See, wow, well, I, I am amazed at Andre. I am amazed at how much Cynthia has grown. But does he go, wow, I am amazed that this person still is the same. I, I, I'm God, and I can't even explain it. I am amazed at what is wrong with this person. See, where there's a will, you will find the way. They took offense at him. Why? Because they knew him, and it was personal. And because it was personal, his presence threatened them. Made them think about themselves. Challenged them in who they were. They let argumentation and rationalization of what they thought to be true get in the way. I recently watched the movie God's Not Dead. It's a good movie. It's very good. But at the very end, it was very disturbing because what they did at the very end was very crafty is that they took the, 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 the argument of, well, what if somebody accepts Christ on their deathbed? Are you telling me they're not saved? They took a crafty argument, and they put you in video form to tug at the hearts of the people. I mean, I have to be honest, even myself was wishing for that person. Man, I wish they were saved, but they're not. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't teach that. See, oftentimes people will come in with their cunning and craftiness is what the Bible says. 
to teach things that ought not be taught. And yet right here, this is exactly what we see. They made excuses to rationalize what they thought was true. But there's one problem with that. You cannot rationalize, you cannot rationalize the truth because we are not rational people. How can the irrational bring upon rational way of thinking? I mean, I just, just take a journal of the way you behave and what you do on a weekly basis. In the end of it, you will find that the way you behave and what you desire is very irrational. Right? For me, I'd love to lose weight, but I mean, that doesn't mean that's I'm going to give up on getting a cheeseburger. That's not rational. We're not rational. And right here, we can try and rationalize the way of God. You can't rationalize God. God's truth is simply found in the Bible. The Bible is rational. And so when you show somebody what it means to be a disciple, that's as rational as they are ever going to get. There's nothing more irrational than a humanistic argument. Well, what if somebody dies and they accept Christ? You're using a humanistic argument to feel better about what the scriptures blatantly teach. But what's the real issue? They didn't have the will to know the way. And right here, Jesus was let down by the same challenge that we face today. And that is that he wanted so badly for his friends and family to support him, but they sadly refused to. I know for me, I'm, I'm probably the... I know when I talk to Raul, we'll talk about just different things. I'm learning in Portland. Raul always say to me, bro, no matter what happens, your trip to Portland was a success because your mom's a disciple now. But I remember when I first became a disciple. And I'll never remember, I'll never forget visiting home. My parents have a stack of papers. They go, Ricky, this is a cult. I go, guys, no, it's not. But man, they were not fired up that I moved to Los Angeles at 17. But you know, praise God, I was filled with faith. I didn't really give them much of an option. I was like, they're like, well, you got to finish school. I already talked to the counselors. I'm going to take an online class. I'll be done by March. They're like, well, uh, I'm like, guys, would you rather me doing drugs? Because I realized in the back of my mind that that was the only thing that was left for me in Portland at that time. So I just wanted to get out of Dodge. I just wanted to get out. And yet, so often we can try and cling to that which is not meant to be in the moment. Or we can refuse to let go of that which is intended to move forward. We can try and hang on to the moment. But rather, we need to be able to embrace the reality that God is in control and that we must trust Him. Yes, we may be amazed. Jesus was amazed here, but one thing He did is He moved on. And sometimes in life, we just got to move on. We can get just stuck with where we're at, but we just got to move forward. And I think it's awesome because even though our physical family may not want to know God at this time, we can embrace one another so much more. You know, at the end of the day, uh, Justin and Angelina getting restored is a victory for all of us. But let me tell you something. Their daughter, Jay, getting baptized is a victory for all of us. See, my mom needs to be just as excited about Jay getting baptized as if my sister was going to get restored. See, we need to share the excitement. We need to embrace one another. You are my brothers and my sisters, so when you have a victory, I have a victory. But do you feel that way this morning? Are you excited to be here? Are you as excited about them getting restored as you would be of your own mom and dad coming to know God? If you don't, then you're not embracing that which is around you. And the next transition coming up will just be one more of many. But Jesus was amazed by them. And oftentimes in our lives, we will be amazed at times. I think, again, with Justin and Angelina, I'm amazed at their repentance. I know for, for Justin, he struggled with, I think a lot of prideful men struggle with this one. He's like, well, where's restoration in the Bible? Show me that. But Justin did something that a lot of men don't have the integrity to do. He searched his Bible. And he stumbled upon Jeremiah 31, verse 18 through 20. 
where God speaks to the people of Israel and calls them to be restored to him. He found the answers for himself. I was amazed when he, I didn't even know he was struggling with it until he told me. He figured it out on his own, but he was struggling and he moved on. He figured it out. And because of that, not only is he being restored, but his wife's being restored, his daughter's getting baptized, and his two sons want to study the Bible as soon as they can. They're still pretty young. You know, I mean, I'm amazed by it. It's a good amazement, but I've had my negative amazements too. I never forget studying the Bible with my best friend. And just before he was going to get baptized, he, he went out to a denominational church and got baptized there to appease the sentimentality inside of him. And I was, I was, I was amazed. What, what are you doing? Yeah. Even Sally, there was a young woman that was studying the Bible uh, here in the church that did the exact same thing. Yeah. It's just amazed. What, what are you doing? You're, you're this close. And you, you, you can't push on? I was amazed by it. But whether we're amazed positive or negative, it doesn't matter. We got to move on. We've got to continue to move forward, not getting stuck in the moment. You know, last night it was awesome. We had Andre and Cynthia's going away party. And it was so incredible because even just being able to hear them share was very inspiring. Just of Andre, just his gratitude for the kingdom. And he shared, I just can't imagine what my life would be like without the kingdom. But, but it wasn't a facade. You could see in his face. I mean, just saying you could see it, it, it bothered him to think that. What would my life be like if I, I didn't have a kingdom? But is, is that how you feel this morning? Does it sicken you to think of what your life would be at like without God? It, it, it's a scary thing. And yet, you know, I was also very, I was very amazed myself at the lack of people that were there last night. I was very disappointed at the amount of people that didn't come. Because if it was your son, your daughter, your best friend, you'd have been there. But if you weren't, it, it, it means that you have bias. Which means you don't understand the relationships we're supposed to have. See, I, I understand we, we all have things happen and there's reasons and exceptions. But at the end of the day, for me, guys, a going away party is top of the list. It, it's worth canceling plans. And I said something to the group that I think we need to hear is, unless God permits Andre and Cynthia to be blown back into Portland again, do you realize that the rest of your life, you're never going to be in, the, in a church with these two amazing disciples again. The only time you're going to have fellowship with them is when you're in heaven. And you missed out on the opportunity to say goodbye. See, we need to embrace one another. Where there's a will, you will find the way. Verse 7 of chapter 6. says, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Again, he moved on. Amen. Calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if, a play, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Wow. I find this is very interesting because we hear this, right? And we, and we think it's exciting, but do we realize that the twelve were sent on their missionary journey immediately after Jesus chose them. So Jesus goes up on the mountainside, and he prays. He comes down, he anoints them. He goes, all right, guys, first things first, you're leaving. Don't take any extra food, clothes, or anything. And only stay in the places where people welcome you and stay as long as you can. And if people don't want to welcome you in, that's okay. Just shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them, and move on. Move on. But I find this powerful because Jesus did not prep them, prime them. He did not spend a couple years with them to get their hearts right. He simply just sent them out. Why? Because what is the greatest quality these apostles had? Dedication. 
They wanted to follow Jesus. They were dedicated to him. But here's something we're going to find out later in the text. They did not acknowledge or recognize that he was the Messiah yet. That's something very powerful to be said. We know we have the Messiah, and a lot of us struggle with commitment and dedication. See, the one quality God is looking for is absolute dedication. And it's cool because he pushed them to go on a limb in their faith because he knew that they were totally dedicated to what he was doing. And so what this means is for us is that we cannot allow our limitations to affect us spiritually. Do you allow your limitations to prevent you from being all you can be? I'm super proud of Mike Foley. Um, you know, Mike is a very effective salesman. And yesterday we went tagging. And I don't think Mike really had ever done sales like that ever before. But I was super proud of him. He just kept pushing himself. And it's probably good he's not in here. He kept pushing himself and fighting past it. And, and even after the tagging event, he was like coming up with ideas of what we could do to make it more effective and more awesome and fun. Why? Because... I guarantee he didn't have fun. I guarantee that it hurt him to be out there. It was discouraging, but he pushed past it and he forced himself to do what he knew was right. Hard times are, re are a reality, but your dedication is proven for what it is in the midst of trials and challenges. See, it's when you're struggling that you have to prove loyal to the cross. And it's going to be challenging. But this is what we're about. You didn't sign up for an easy life. You didn't sign up for them to take 401k out of your, your daily tithe or your weekly tithe so you just get in retirement later. No, no. You signed up to pour everything you have into what we're doing so that when you do die, you can go to heaven for eternity. I want to challenge us though. What is it that prevents you from making that decision? See, I fear that maybe in this room, some of us, we haven't really made that decision in certain areas of our life. We, we have conditional commitments. I want to challenge you, what areas do you struggle with? I want to challenge you to do the opposite. Do the opposite. You struggle with sharing your faith? Do it. Right? You're any area you're struggling in your life, do the opposite and do what is right. Why? Because where there's a will, you will always find the way. Point number two, you don't need much to make a miracle. Let's go to the next few verses. You don't need much to make a miracle. Now, this is what's powerful because in verse 14 through 29, John the Baptist is beheaded. Now, who is John the Baptist? This is Jesus' cousin. And so we pick it up in verse 30. It says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught them because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. I love this because right here, Jesus, both of them are exhausted. We have to understand that. We have to understand the scenario here. Both of them are exhausted. The apostles just finished up their missionary journey. So, but they're exhausted, what? From excitement. They drove out demons. They performed miracles. I mean, they're fired up. I mean, they had a day at Disneyland. Yeah, you're tired at the end of the day when you go to Disneyland, but it's a good tired. Jesus is exhausted from sorrow. His cousin was murdered. So Jesus was exhausted, but he was exhausted from sorrow, a very, very different feeling of, of exhaustion. And yet, they, Jesus goes, guys, Let's just get out of here and go hang out. And once your heart's content with something, isn't it suck when, when something prevents that? I, I mean, I think, you know, when, when, Sundays are, are tough for me. Up late, finishing up the sermon, uh, usually 1, 2 in the morning sometimes, up at 5, 5.30, kind of going through it, making sure I got it down. Um, and then come in, make sure the service is set up, pre-service, main service, of course, fellowshipping, etc., then we have leaders meeting. And then if I really want to kill myself, then we have a campus movie night at my house. 
just because I really want to make myself suffer, you know what I mean? So by Sunday, I'm just exhausted. And so, man, if, if, if a brother were to call me at 6 in the morning on Monday, I would relate to this scripture. I'm like, man, I, I deserve this amount of sleep. And right here, Jesus is like, guys, let's just get out of here and let's just go rest. We're all exhausted. Let's just hang out. And, and imagine, it's not just like a few people are like, hey, you got a couple last minute miracles you can help us out with. No, no, no. Imagine if we were all going to come over here and everybody from Tiger to Wallace and Wilsonville, Northeast Portland, Hillsboro, Beaverton, everybody, close to 10,000 people. It says 5,000 were fed, but that doesn't include the women and children. And we can hear the kids over here. Imagine like a thousand of those little rascals. They had kids kingdom back there. And Gidget was there pulling the collectors together, servants, and they had snacks. And But I mean, imagine, I mean, that amount of people, and you get up on the shore edge, you're like, oh my gosh, what is going on? But the apostles just had an awesome time. But it was Jesus whose heart was compassionate. Because Jesus saw that the bigger challenge ahead was that the people were harassed and helpless. So he helped them. And he spoke to them. And so yes, the apostles were drained. They were drained. But they had a breaking point. And we all have a breaking point. For a lot of us, it's when we get hangry. And, and, and anger is like, it's like exponential, isn't it? It's like you're kind of frustrated. And then like you just are like, to rage. Right? It's not like just like little steps. It's like you just can't control it at some point. Before you know it, you're just in full on sin because they shorted you french fries. Or you asked for extra stuff in your blizzard and they didn't give you extra stuff. It's like an inch of goodies and then below it is just like a gallon of just regular soft serve ice cream and that rage just comes upon you. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you can't. But we go on and we find the breaking point of the apostles. And, in, and right here we see in verse 35 it says, By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's, it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. They said to him, That would take more than half a year's wages. Are we going to go and spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found them, when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves. He gave, he gave them to his disciples, to the, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Wow. Here's their breaking point. They're hungry. They're tired. They go, look, Jesus is getting late. I'm really concerned about the people. I think we should send them away so they could go get something to eat. Of course, was that really their heart? Not really. Right, is it ready? To, is it time to relax now? And Jesus, you know, you got like that brother that always says, well, you don't want him to say, hey, I think they should get going. He's like, why don't we feed them? <laughs> and they're like, I'm about fed up with this Jesus guy. <laughs> and they go, that would take half a year's wait. Now, if you look at it, they go, should we just go buy that? They probably had the money. But they didn't see the need. But what they didn't understand is that you don't need that much to make a miracle. You just need God. Right. See, they were focused on their own strength. Yeah. They weren't looking to God for strength. Right. And so Jesus goes, bring me the loaves, bring me the fish, and let's get this party started. Okay. So then what does he do? He sets them in groups of hundreds and fifties, and then who is it that serves them? The disciples! Right. This was their breaking point. I'm hungry, I'm tired, and now I'm ticked. So much so that it hardened 
their hearts. That is, you go on in the text. Jesus sends the people away. The apostles get in a boat to leave. The wind is blowing against them. They're trying to row. They're stuck in the middle of the lake. Jesus goes up to pray. Then about in the middle of the night, Jesus comes down, walks on water. And they're so caught up in what they're doing that they don't even realize he's walking on water. And then when they do see him, they think he's a ghost. See, when we get tired, we become irrational. Yeah. And they think he's a ghost. And then he gets in, he goes, don't be afraid, it is I. And it's at that moment they begin to connect that, whoa, this guy is not normal. But it says, if, if you jump down real quick, we'll go, we'll go back into it, but if you jump down into verse 52, or in verse uh, 50, 51, it says, Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. The work of God became a burden to the apostles. They lost sight of the miracle that was at hand. And we have to understand that Jesus was not focused on the cost, but rather the miracle at hand. It doesn't take a lot to make a miracle, but sometimes we can make it out to be a lot. Is 20 times really a lot? Not really, but we make it a lot, don't we? But instead we go, man, a hundred times. That's still nothing compared to seeing people saved all around the world. See, where, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. See, their hearts, what was it? They, they were consumed in themselves at that moment because they were tired. You know, but for us, do we look at the cost to determine the miracle? Oh, this is how much it costs? Uh, it's not worth it. This is all it's going to cost? Oh, that's a good miracle. Yeah, let's do that one. Whether it be staying up until 2 in the morning with a brother or sister to help them spiritually. Whether it be being in a Bible study at 2 in the morning. Whether it be going tagging. I know some of you guys are sinking in your seats. Or whether it just be the never-ending kingdom schedule. Oh, we got, you know, we got sharing on Tuesday, maybe we go on Wednesday, Bible talk on Thursday, single or marriage devil on Saturday, going away party, church, leaders. When does it end? It ends in heaven. But it could end now with your walk with God. See, we're so cost-based, but there's a proverb, Proverbs 23, verse 6, that I think is very important. See, because when our commitment is contingent on the cost, that devastates the church. Because you just have a group of uncommitted people. You go, well, I'm kind of committed. Let me tell you something. There's total commitment and there's no commitment. Proverbs 23, verse 6, though, says, Do not eat the food of a stingy man, or as the new NIV says, a begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies. They, they're delicious. For he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. That's a tough one right there, man. But what is this? This is somebody who's particular with their heart, who's not giving, who's not sacrificial. Yeah, 20 times. Yeah, let's jump in that Bible study. But you, you're really not there. You're the begrudging host. And the compliments are wasted. See, the apostles were consumed with what they could do, not with what God could do. But at what point do you draw a line in the sand as to what you're willing to do for God? You know, I appreciate um, just even the McKeans, you know, they always tell about a story in Boston. And uh, a church had raised a million dollars to buy a church building. And so the, the million dollar question was raised, who's going to raise a million dollars dollar to send out missions? And then anybody that knows Kip knows, well, we are. People sold their homes. And even Kip and Elena took it upon themselves to sell the diamond from Elena's ring. And to this day, it's a cubic zirconium, is that what you call it? It's fake. It's not a real diamond. 
there was no limit to what he was willing to do. I appreciate the, the uh, Reeds who lead the Eugene Church. Just before they came up here to Eugene to lead the church, missions, they didn't have the money, so they sold their only car. Believing that God would provide in which he did. Now, they had an infant baby. They put their faith on the line to be able to do whatever it takes. And even for Colleen and myself, man, this year's been super tough for missions. We're pulling together all resources, we're there tagging, we're, we're, we're doing the soul run. But we've decided that if we can't get the missions, we're going to sell Colleen's wedding band to get the rest of our missions. What are you limiting yourself to do to get it done? What are you willing to sell? What are you willing to do to see souls saved around the world? If you pull out this piece of paper real quick, it's the crown of thorns. And you begin to understand that this is the vision. This is the goal. And if we have any limitations, if we're the stingy man, there's no way we can accomplish this together. It's incredible because just seven years ago is when this was initiated. And already we're almost done. By next summer, we'll only have one church left on the list. But it's amazing to think that since 2008, we've been able to plant churches and initiate churches in Las Vegas, in San Diego, Santa Barbara, Boston, Dallas, Denver, Gainesville, Honolulu, Houston, Miami, New York City, Orlando, Philadelphia, Sacramento's coming up, San Francisco, uh, Toronto, and Washington, D.C., and all the main cities. We plant a church in Santiago, London, Sao Paulo, Mexico City. Paris, Sydney, Chennai, Moscow, Manila. And next summer, Johannesburg and Cairo. And the summer after that, Hong Kong. This is what the 20 times is going to. This is what we're about. Saving the world. But if that's not what you're about, then you're not about God's purpose. And you can sit in here, but it's not real. It's not real. But even more than that, that's just phase one, guys. This is important to understand. I mean, what you're giving you 20 times, this is what it's going to. I mean, these are the churches we're planting. But you know what's even more incredible is if you go to the back, uh, phase two is that these key cities must then evangelize their known area. So, for example, South America is the world sector led by the Morenos, who lead the church in Sao Paulo. But if you look here, in 2016, it's on there to plant a church in Bogota, Colombia. See, that's phase two in act. Is now the South American churches are planning more churches. You even look at, uh, right here, you've got the Moscow. The Russian Commonwealth World Sector that we just planted in Moscow. Already in 2017, there's a plan to plant a church in Kiev. Next summer, we're going to Johannesburg. Already there's a plan to get into Abidjan and Lagos. I mean, guys, this is what we're doing. But the foundational work is the hardest. Where do you draw the line in the sand in what you're willing to do? Is it your own needs? Your own stuff? Your own desires? We have to be willing to stretch ourselves. Even more exciting, I didn't mention, even this next summer, we're going to be planning a church in Bangalore. Nobody knows what that is, do they? Does anyone know what that is? India. India. Now, the Chennai Church, the second most populated country in the world, one of the poorest countries in the world, is now going to be able to branch out and plant a new church. And, of course, consider one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Rio de Janeiro. We're all volunteering. Stevie's already got her name on that one. But, guys, this is just the beginning. Yeah, maybe we're going to get in. Maybe we'll get to, uh, you know, maybe we'll get to Bogota, Colombia. But what about the rest of the entire country? We can't get to the whole country if we don't get to the main capital. This is what we're doing. This is what it means to seek first his kingdom. And if you can't invest in this, then don't tell yourself you're righteous. Because the only righteous desire you have is to improve your own life. And that's not righteousness. Jesus did not die on the cross so you could improve your own life. He died on the cross so we could do something like this to save the world. 
One of the brothers, again, I just want to lift up with both, actually, is Andre and Cynthia. So proud of you guys. To see Andre, who when he came in here was quiet, didn't talk. Now he preaches, he song leads, he, I mean, he does everything. And even, uh, you know, Cynthia, Miss If You Insist, who was, even as a disciple, was just so concerned about wanting to have a purpose in life. Like, sis, your purpose is here. Wanting to go somewhere here, go there, travel. To now see her willing to step up to lead the Latin ministry. And now to go on a mission team to Sacramento. It's so incredible. And even on, on Friday when we were tagging, Andre was able to raise about 100 bucks. Just in his group with him and a couple people. Because he was just out there hustling. He went from the quietest guy to the biggest hustler. That's God. That's how God works. But it's because he understands a very simple practical. In Mark 10, verse 29 to 31, Jesus very, tells, very simply tells the people that if you give up mother, brother, father, sister, he says, in this life, you will not fail to receive a hundred times that in this life. And as I said before, as he shared his going away party, you could see the gratitude in his eyes. He understood the scripture. He's willing to give up his father and his mother to move down to Sacramento. He's given up his sisters that are now in Los Angeles and even Margarita leaving. Uh, David and Margarita are still here. It's not even a question to give those things up. And even when, uh, we, when I'd asked him originally about the mission team, he's a little nervous. And I said, what about your parents? He's like, I don't know, bro, but one way or another, I'm going to Sacramento. <laughs> he didn't, there was no cost. He goes, bro, there's nothing that's going to stop me from following God's call. Come on, Andre. See, but again, where do we draw the line? Another brother I'm super proud of is Gordo back here. You know, it's because Jesus knew the apostles were invested that he was willing to push them to this extent. And yet I think about Gordo. Just about a month and a half ago, just very lethargic, just not, not busy in his purpose. And yet this last month, I'm so proud of you, bro. He's just stepped up in such an incredible way that even on Friday, we had a little, 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 talk, little talk, we went to tag, and he's like, he pulled an apostle, like, we should send them home to go eat. He goes, hey, bro, should I go tagging, or should I get my dad to come to Bible talk? He goes, why don't you see if he wants to come first? He goes, oh, he doesn't want to come. I'll be there as soon as I can. Right? And then after tagging, he goes, man, I'm just so tired, bro. He's, I'm up at 6 in the morning doing landscaping all day, and then I go on campus and share. We have midweek. I have Bible talk, Devo. I'm just so tired. I'm like, bro, this is how life's supposed to be. And now he's doing great spiritually because of it. You know, but I appreciate it. You know, Gordon's got a lot going on. I mean, it, you know, we're pushing him to sell his car, to give his missions. But not only that, but to raise money before we move down to Los Angeles so that he can have a smooth transition. There's a lot going on. It's a lot of pressure. But that's why he's doing good. Some of us are dull-faced because you're boring and you're bored. You're not doing anything. And I gave the brothers on Wednesdays a fierce challenge. And that is to be about our purpose. Amen. Yeah. Revelation 21.8 talks about the sins that lead to hell. And it mentions immorality and these things. But you know what the two, first two things are? Yeah. Cowardliness and disbelief. Unbelief. What's worse than immorality? A coward who's afraid to share their faith. And somebody that refuses to believe that those that they share with don't want to change. Wow. We've got to be about our purpose. But the bigger one was the fellowship guy. I believe that it's, it's a supreme sin to walk into God's sanctuary, to walk in to worship God with a downcast spirit. You know how as an excuse to be down? Jesus when he died on the cross. And yet he wasn't down. He was filled with joy. How much more us to come here and worship God? So the challenge is this. If you see someone, they look a little down, I want you to pull them aside. I want you to pray with them. Talk to them. Encourage them. But one way or another, we are not going to be down in here. Amen. But I fear that maybe some of us have put lines and limitations in our relationship with God. I want to challenge us to, 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 to get rid of those lines. Because the coolest part of this passage for me, if you look back into the verse, in verse 43, it says that they picked up a certain amount of baskets. What number was it? Twelve. One basket per who? Each apostle. 
One basket per apostle. Now, these aren't like little communion baskets. These are baskets that a grown man could fit in, filled with bread. What do we see here? We see that when you pour yourself out, when you're willing to do whatever it takes to get something done, a miracle of God, He will reward you with exponentially more than, more than you even need. He'll give you more than you need. And the challenge is the thing that you're chasing, that you think you want, the fulfillment you want, it's only going to come to you if you're willing to pour yourself out to build up God's kingdom in pursuing His righteousness. You know, this is what we're about, guys. Do you know all the cities on the Crown of Thorns project? Do you know the plan? I mean, I'd find it difficult to give 20 times if I didn't know what I was giving it to. This is what you're given to. I want to challenge you. Memorize this paper. Because each, it may just seem like a city, but there are millions of souls in each and every one of these cities. Sao Paulo alone has 25 million people. That is literally 12 times the population of the entire metropolitan of Portland. That's what you gave your money to three years ago. This summer we're being able to plant Church of Manila, it's a lot of people that need to know God. That's what you're giving your money to. Yeah. Stockholm, Sweden, that's what you're giving your money to. You're not giving it to me, you're not giving it to the church. You're giving it to God to save souls. Why? This is what Jesus lived for, guys. Yeah. This is what Jesus was all about. Yeah. So let's get this done, amen? amen? To the glory of God. And let's live every day as if it was a day in Jesus' ministry. Amen. To God be the glory.